Good morning. Well, as you're probably aware, last week John kicked us off with a new sermon series, Intimacy, Passion and Hunger. And I think each one feeds into the next one. Uh, our, our passion for Christ has to depend upon our intimacy with Christ. And then our passion, well, that can lead to a hunger for Christ. So what I want to focus on more than anything this morning is intimacy, our intimacy with Jesus Christ. I've got a bit of an echo here. I don't know whether that's affecting anyone at all, but uh, I'm sure they'll sort it out as we go on. Now, I met with John um, a couple of weeks ago as we discussed this new sermon series that he was bringing. And John said to me, Bill, he said, a, a number of people know you in the church, know you as Bill, but they don't know much about you, where you came from, what your background is, what your testimony is. So as we go into this intimacy with Christ, John said, to begin with, and it, it is only for me the, part, the first part of the, the talk, that I'd, I'd just like to give you a little bit of my testimony, how I came to faith in Jesus. And I need to take us back to September in the year 1999, just before the millennium. My wife, Pauline, had um, been battling with cancer all that year, and uh, she'd had chemotherapy, surgery, radiotherapy, and nothing worked. And in September, she died. Now, we'd been together for 30 years. Uh, we had children, we had grandchildren, and I was absolutely distraught. I had no faith. I wasn't a Christian at that time. I knew nothing about the salvation of Jesus Christ or any of those things. I was totally in the dark. And um, Duncan, the, the guy who took the uh, funeral service, we didn't have a church service, it was just a streetly crematorium, uh, the local vicar who took that service, uh, he phoned me up, and uh, this was at the end of October, and he said, we, every year, he says, we do an, what we call an in loving memory service, where we just like to thank God for those who've gone on before us. And I'd uh, love to invite you and your family to come along to that service right at the end of October. So myself and the kids, we, we went along to that service. Everybody was very friendly and very nice. And it meant absolutely nothing. <laughs> Simple as that, like, you know, came out and just never even give it another thought. It's actually three days later, Wednesday evening, quarter past seven in the evening. I don't know why, but for some reason, everything happens to seem to happen to me at quarter past seven, either morning or evening. But anyway, quarter past seven in the evening, I'm sitting there on the settee. I can't remember whether the television was on or not. And all of a sudden, I had a powerful urge. I didn't hear any voices or anything like that. I just had this powerful urge to go upstairs and into the front lounge. When the kids had left home, what we'd actually done was converted one of the front bedrooms into a, a, an upstairs lounge. So I went upstairs into this lounge, went over to a writing bureau, dropped it down, opened a drawer, and took out a little copy of the King James Version of the New Testament. I had never seen this Bible before. I didn't even know it was there. There was an inscription in the front, which was given to Pauline at the Girl Guides uh, when she, in 1955, I think it was, something like that. And um, I'd just never seen it before. And so, just out of curiosity, I opened it. I opened it at random. And it, it was in First John. See how much the Father loves us, that we are called sons of God, or sons and daughters of God, you know, as, as we know that means now. And I thought, I've heard that before. And you know, I was trying to think, yeah, that was, that was the talk that was given just three days ago at that In Loving Memory service. Wow, what a coincidence. Anyway, I closed it, opened it again at random. 
In my father's home, there are many rooms, and I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. That struck a chord, and I'm still trying to puzzle out what's going on. Closed it, opened it again, just at random. I am the resurrection of the life. Those who believe in me will never die. Do you believe in this? And in an instant, I knew that this was for real. The only way I can describe it is the words in the scriptures came alive, left the pages of the Bible and permeated into my very being. There was all sorts of weird noises coming out of me and I was totally lost in some sort of um, euphoria. I know now with uh, um, hindsight, looking back, that I was actually being baptised with the Holy Spirit. But I had no idea what that meant or anything about it. The next morning I went into Litchfield, into W.H. Smith's, and I bought a copy of uh, the Bible, uh, the complete Bible, and in a version that was sort of in modern language. Turned out it was an NIV, but I, I just wanted one in a modern language, and it was a paperback. For the next three months, I devoured that word of God. I have no idea how many times I read through the whole Bible, but I just couldn't put it down. And it was like as if the Holy Spirit was with me every moment of the way, opening the scriptures before me, teaching me what they all meant. And, it, you know, it was just a powerful, powerful time of learning by myself with the Holy Spirit, but feeling the power of God at the same time every time I opened it. And then uh, it was um, at the end of um, January, Duncan, this lovely man of God, uh, who had taken this uh, in loving memory service, phoned me up and he said, we're, we're doing a, an Alpha course. Would you like to come on it? And I said, yes, I would, please. And uh, so the first night of the Alpha course, it was at the plant, if you remember the plant pub that used to be up the road, it's not there now, it's houses, but it was at the plant, and um, I went along on the 2nd of February, and everything that I'd been taught by the Holy Spirit and been reading dropped into place. Everything locked firmly into place. I went home that evening, I got down on my knees, I told Jesus I would follow him, whatever happened, whatever he asked, the answer would be yes, always yes, never anything else. And it's been an amazing walk of intimacy with him ever since. I always remember, it was only about, um, yeah, about a month after that um, coming to faith and telling Jesus how much I was going to follow him. I remember standing outside at the back, at the, open the patio door, and there's the garden. And of course, it's got all the ravishes of winter on it, you know, and it needs a lot of work doing on it. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me very clearly. He said, your life feels like that garden, doesn't it? And I said, yes, it does. And he said, well, we're going to work on it together. And it doors just opened all the time. I found myself without sort of applying, I don't remember applying for anything, doing courses, uh, discipleship and leadership, pastoral care, did a two-year pastoral care course with, with the diocese, and then was licensed as a preacher in the Anglican Church, preacher and Bible teacher in uh, 2005. But the greatest blessing and thrill of them all was I met Norma. Now, Norma had lost her husband about, I think it was about five or six months after I lost my wife. She was a member of the, the church that I'd been attending now. Uh, and when I started attending that church, it was like going to the dentist, I've got to tell you that. I did not want to go, but I felt the Lord was dragging me into the church, kicking and screaming at every time. Everybody was so friendly, and I soon got used to it. But uh, Norma was also a member of that church, and I met her, and we actually married in, in the church service, uh, communion service, Sunday morning, uh, packed out service. We married there, there and we had eight of the most wonderful and blessed years you could imagine. And then in December 2011, Norma died again of cancer. 
I had something that I, this time that I'd never had before. I had absolute faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And God the Father spoke to me. And this is what he said. Don't try to figure this out for yourself, son. I love it when he calls me son. Don't try to figure this out for yourself, son, because you can't do it. It's beyond you. Just keep your eyes focused on my higher throne. Be still and know that I am God. And that's what I've done ever since. And his, his power, his strength has been there. I've had times when, yeah, it's really hurt, but the more I've felt the pain and hurt, the more that intimacy with God has grown. And so what I want to just talk to you now this morning is about intimacy and how important it is for our relationship with God. Because let me tell you now, without intimacy, there is no relationship. You can't have it with that. And if you've got your Bible with you, I'd like you to go with me, please, to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, <clears throat> and I'm going to read from verses 9 to 13. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned... I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. What an amazing experience that must have been for John. Wow. And John said, it was on the Lord's Day when it took place. Well, that could mean it was on a Saturday which, of course, is the Sabbath day. We know that John was a Jewish Christian. But also, by this time, the church was calling Sunday as the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, because this was the day the Lord rose from the grave. And, of course, we are here celebrating the Lord's Day, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there are theologians and, um, who put an entirely different slant on what John meant by the Lord's Day. You see, towards the end of the first century, Emperor Domitian sent out a decree that all in his empire should worship him as God the Lord. Residents of the empire were ordered to come to the public square, burn a pinch of incense, and speak the words, See Securius. Caesar is Lord. Became known as the Lord's Day in the Roman Empire. And refusal could result in imprisonment, confiscation of property, banishment, and even death. Christians, however, did refuse, which is probably why John finished up exiled to the salt mines on the island of Patmos. And what these theologians teach us is that what John meant by the Lord's Day was Lord with a small L rather than a large one, this day when everybody burnt incense to, see, to Caesar. Now, I have no idea whether that is right or wrong, and I'm certainly not going to lose any sleep over it. It doesn't matter to me. But the fact still remains is that Christians were told to worship Caesar as God, bow to his image and burn a pinch of incense. Just give a token nod to the emperor of God, they were told. The Christians were actually told, look, you guys, you don't even have to mean it. You know, just go through the motions. Just burn this pinch of incense, just bow, and then go home and put it all behind you. You don't have to mean it. 
Just compromise. Just compromise. And we'll come back to this word compromise in a moment, which has got powerful connotations. As most of you know, I work with Open Doors in this ministry to persecuted Christians across the world. And obviously we all know the great persecutions that are taking place. But please, let's not underestimate that we in the West are not immune to the ways that the devil works. You know, there was a bunch of uh, British Christians a few years back. They met some Chinese believers in China who had suffered many forms of persecution for their faith. And one of the Chinese believers, how much, asked these UK Christians, how much persecution they suffered in the UK for their faith. And one of the British Christians replied, well, we don't really experience persecution in our country. A young Chinese woman, without any trace of irony, replied, you mean they don't allow the devil in your country? I remember when we met with uh, Hannah and Yusuf, Christians who lived in Damascus at the height of the civil war, pastor the church there. They told us how every night when they put their young daughters to bed, they told them if a bomb went off in the night, there might be a lot of blood, but if that happens, we'll all be with Jesus. Now I, for one, cannot imagine tucking your kids in bed at night with that type of talk. But Anna then went on to say something that is really astounding, but perhaps very true. She said, we are better off than you are in England. For we can see Satan's attacks for what they are. They are full on, they are brutal. But for you, they are covert, underhand, and you don't see them coming until they're on top of you. And that leads to compromising your faith. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah? You know, in, at this particular moment, I don't need to spell it out to you what's going on in, in this nation. We know that um, worldviews that not many, many years ago would have seemed unimaginable are boiling up and simmering over now. Lines have been crossed that expose our children to things that would never have been participated in the fact. And we see the vilification of parents for merely wanting an input and influence on the educational and medical needs of their own children. And that brings us back to that little word with the masochist consequences. Compromise. Can I tell you something? You cannot have intimacy with Christ and compromise the word of Christ. It is not possible. If you compromise your faith, if I compromise my faith, I will not have intimacy with Christ. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve Christ and you cannot serve a spirit of compromise. And this is what the word will tell us. Just burn that little bit of incense. Just go through the motions. Just make a nod to it. Don't, don't, you don't want to be called names, do you? You don't want to be called a bigot. You don't want to call phobia this, phobia that. Go through the motions. Just nod in agreement. Burn that little pinch of incense. You don't have to mean it. This is the temptation that Satan tried to give on Jesus in the desert wilderness. Jesus, use your power. Compromise the word of God. Turn these stones into bread. You're hungry. He won't mind. Throw yourself down from the temple. When they see the angels carrying you down so you don't strike a foot against the stone, they're all going to believe in you. You won't need to go through all the cross and everything else like that. They'll, they'll, they'll herald you as Messiah. Jesus, if you will just bow down once, just give a little nod to me, just bow down just on one occasion in, in, in worship to me. You don't have to mean it. That doesn't matter. Just do it. Go through the motions. And then Jesus... You can go back to heaven with the authority over the nations that you've come for because I'll give it to you. 
And then you don't have to go through the cross. You can go back into heaven and say, Father, I've got, all the, I've got the authority. Just compromise, Jesus. Obviously, Jesus does not compromise. And he does not want us to compromise either because he wants intimacy with us. And he knows that we can't have intimacy and compromise at the same time. Revelation 12, 17 tells us the devil has declared war on all those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. We really are in a war zone. And there is no middle ground as such. There's no fence that we can sit on. And in this respect, I'd like to take us to Matthew's Gospel, if you'll go with me there, please, to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. And I'm going to read verses 13 to 14. These are the words of Jesus. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. You know, many people, many Christians, think that Jesus here is talking about salvation and hell. You know, the, the, the narrow path is the one that, through the narrow gate, they walk in the narrow path, leads to salvation. Walk the broad path, and you're on your way to hell, buddy, because everybody's, that's where everybody goes. It's the easy path. So that's what many people think. And the reason they think that is because they take the scripture out of its context. And when we take scripture out of its context, it suddenly takes on a completely different meaning. Not to deny, of course, that hell is very real, I want to seriously challenge this concept that this is all about salvation and hell. And the reason why, when we look at it in its context, is this, of course, is part of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount that covers chapters 5, 6 and 7 in Matthew's Gospel. Now, the opening verse to the Sermon on the Mount which we find in chapter 5, verse 1, says this. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples followed him. Who, deci- who followed him? His disciples followed him, and he began to teach them. You see, his disciples followed him up the mountain. The crowds did not follow him up the mountain. Crowds will follow Jesus when the going is easy but they will not follow Jesus when the going gets tough. And uh, you may respect, remember that last week John was speaking on the difference between followers and disciples. So Jesus speaks of two roads to his disciples. One has a wide gate, a broad road, plenty of company, but it leads to destruction. The road has a small gate, a narrow road, There are few people on it, but it leads to life. Now, as I said, many think of the broad road as living outside of Christ and on the way to hell, and the narrow way is the Christian life on the way to salvation. For us to say, given that the Sermon on the Mount is not evangelism, but as we've seen, is given to people who have already become disciples, we have to put a different interpretation on this. There is a road to destruction that Christians may go along, but it's not the eternal destruction of the soul. It's a compromise that leads to the destruction of all that may have been the fruit in their lives that could have brought glory to Jesus. Is this making sense to you? Yeah. So when we compare the two roads side by side, the broad road seems more attractive, doesn't it, to monsters? modern sensibilities. To be narrow is not a popular concept today, is it? We like, we like to be broad-minded, accepting of everything. Yeah, you know, we're all, we're all in this together. It's the broad road. Many people would like to be considered broad and tolerant, thinking of these as virtues of maturity. 
our, our humanity together. However, in this passage, Jesus is saying that it's a narrow path that's virtuous, for it has a destination in mind and it's going to it. You know, many years ago, I used to pilot light aircraft. And if you're flying to one place, you used to set a compass heading. And if you were just one or two degrees off that compass heading, you would not finish up where you were planning to go. You'd be somewhere completely different. If a plane takes off from, say, um, Heathrow Airport en route for New York, and the pilot just has one degree off his compass heading that way or that way, it will either finish up somewhere down by Miami or somewhere over Canada. It will not reach its destination. And it's in this sense that the road to life is narrow. We cannot simply head in any direction we choose and end up at the same destination. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you'd like to go there, it's worth looking at. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul speaks on how the day of judgment, our works will be exposed to what they are. In that passage of scripture, these are of course the words of the Apostle Paul, beginning at verse 10, Paul says this, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. Reach should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, these works will, be, works will be shown for what they are because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, yet still be saved, only as one escaping through the flames. I think a good way of sort of explaining this passage of scripture is Paul is painting a picture. You wake up in the middle of the night, the fire alarm's going off like crazy. The house is on fire. You open the bedroom door, you quickly shut it. That's no way out through there. Flames are racing up the, up the stairs. The only way out is through the bedroom window. So you open the bedroom window and you lower yourself down as best as you can into the garden below, hoping that you don't break a leg or anything. And there, there you stand in only your pyjamas, watching all your possessions go up in smoke. And then you suddenly realise you forgot to cancel the fire insurance. Forgot to renew the fire insurance, I say. You have lost everything except your life. Those who have built using gold, silver, costly stones will see their good works have attained eternal glory. And they will receive Jesus' affirmation. Well done, my faithful and trusted servant. Those who have used wood, hay or straw, gone through the motions, compromised. That they will see that everything they've done has no lasting significance for the kingdom of God. Because they've spent all their lives compromising their faith on, 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 on the broad road. They've got no intimacy with Jesus. They've never shared it with him. But, and this is important for us to grasp, they are still saved. This is because, and this is so important for us all to grasp, our salvation is not dependent upon our deeds and actions. Our salvation is dependent on what Jesus has already done for us. It is by grace and grace alone that we have been saved and it is not of ourselves. I said I came to faith in September, uh, sorry, in uh, February, the year 2000. I was baptised, by the way, in full immersion in, in, in um, May of that year. Kids were all there and everything. It was great. And then seven months later, in September, I had an out-of-body experience. 
It's quarter past seven. In, I don't know, quarter past seven. It all closed up. But it's quarter past seven in the morning. And I'm in the shower. All of a sudden, I'm not in the shower. I'm in the throne room of heaven. And I know it's the throne room of heaven because this great massive white throne is there. You can't miss it right in the middle there. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't remember dying, but I, I must have died to be here. But I'm a Christian now. I've got faith in Jesus, so it doesn't matter. I'm all right there. And then Jesus came into the room. He's wearing a long white robe with a gold sash just as described around his chest. But I couldn't see his face. It was too bright, too, 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 too glorious, I suppose, for me to look upon it. And he came to me and he said, Bill, I am really disappointed in you. Oh, I was absolutely floored. Now I knew that my salvation was safe. That wasn't the question. But who on earth wants to enter into heaven knowing that Jesus is disappointed in them? I certainly didn't. And um, then all of a sudden, it, it, there was like this window that was at a 45 degree angle that looked down. And he took me over to this and we looked down in it. And it was a vision of hell below us. It was like a river with all people in it. And I knew they were all people I knew. I actually recognised one of them. But they were all people I knew. And then Jesus turned to me and I know he was crying. I know there was tears in his eyes and I couldn't see his face. And he turned to me and he said, you could have saved them. And then I was back in the shower trying to figure out all that was going on. As a, as a new Christian, um, I'd been put in a house group of the church. House groups are great, by the way, be part of them. And um, I shared it, shared it with the people in the house group there. And they gave me some good advice. Pray about it. So I prayed about it. And I realised that when I came to faith in Jesus, I'd gone into Bur I got all the kids together, told them about the fa my faith in Jesus, how Jesus was real, and how he loved them, and how they needed to come to faith in Jesus. I'd gone and visited my sister who lived in Birmingham and told her about Jesus and her husband. I always remember what she said to me. She said, you mean anybody can be saved? And I said, yeah. She said, even my English. I said, yeah, if she, if she repents and believes. Then I went down to Devon where my brother lived and told him about my faith in Jesus. His wife thought I'd joined a cult. But I was telling everybody I knew and loved. But at work, I told no one. I hadn't told a soul. I was a, a sales manager, surveyor uh, for a, a home improvement company. And I just never even mentioned it. I don't know why. I know now, obviously, I was compromising my faith. Maybe I didn't want them to think, oh, another one of the gods. I don't know. But obviously, it was a compromise of my faith. And I knew that Jesus was saying to me, I brought you out of the darkness so you could go back into the darkness to those in darkness and tell them about me. And you're not doing that. So I knew I had to do something totally different. I thought, well, I can't put a soapbox in the factory and tell everybody, gather around, you've got to get real with Christ. So I've got some news for you because, well, that wouldn't work. So I started t peppering my tour. It was really great. You have a good weekend. Yeah, I had a great weekend. It was great on Sunday. We had a great service. And we had a meal together afterwards. And the response, you, church, you've got to be joking. And word soon got round. Bill's going to church. Bill's got religion. And the actual response I, I understand back from us, Bill, you've got to be joking. He's a mercenary when he comes to sales, finances and all things like that. But gradually, people started asking me questions. There was one guy, uh, Simon, he came to me. He said, you're a Christian, aren't you, Bill? I said, yes, indeed. He said, I wonder if you can help me. He lived in Fradley. He said, we've got a poltergeist. He says, and we keep having books all thrown off the case and everything. Things moved around, things going bump in the night. Wife's well, terrified. What can we do about it? And so, being a good Anglican that I was at this time, I said, we'll go along and see the local Anglican vicar, tell him what's going on. 
and he's got authority over Bradley, over your house, ask him to come and bless your church. Sorry, bless your, bless your home. Cleanse it. Anyway, I saw him about two weeks later. He said, I did what you told. He says, lovely guy. He says, he came around, he went into every room, the garage, even went into the loft, blessed every room. And he says, it's totally peaceful, it's gone. He says, but we live in a four terrace block. He said, it's moved into the one at the other end. I said, well, you better tell them <laughs> about how Jesus sets people free. There was, a, there was another guy, a uh, lovely guy called Jim. He used to come in and buy things off us. And he was, think he was an Irish guy, and he, he was having a chat this one day. And he said he was thinking about moving back to Ireland. And he said, but I'm in two minds whether to do it. He says, because the troubles are always there in the background, ready to kick off. And I said, yeah, Jim, religion is a terrible thing. And he looked at me and he said, but you're religious. I said, Jim, I'm not religious. I have an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That has got nothing to do with religion. Jesus in Revelation 3.19 says, Those I love, I rebuke and discipline. I had been rebuked and disciplined in the throne of Christ, throne room of Christ, because Jesus loves me. And so he said, be earnest and repent. And I repented. You know, one question that's often asked, isn't it, is, will there be tears in heaven? I think there must be. Why else would the Bible say that God will wipe away all our tears if there are no tears there? Uh, you know, and I think it could have some significance for those who weep over their lost opportunities to serve Jesus. They've compromised their faith. They're saved by grace and grace alone, but they've got nothing to show for their Christian faith. And then all of a sudden, they are face to face with the risen Christ in all of his glory. Oh, can you just imagine the glory of Christ? And there you are in your presence. And you look back over a wasted life. Of course, you're going to be crestfallen, aren't you? That's why God will have to wipe away the tears. But God does not want you to be a builder who loses everything. Rather, he wants you to shine ever brighter with his glory as the Holy Spirit forms in you the likeness of Jesus Christ to draw you into an ever deeper intimacy with him. An intimacy will, that will lead to a passion that will be Christ first and above all else. And that passion will develop a hunger for Christ that will never be sated, will never be satisfied. I don't want to have a, say, I'm not hungry for Christ anymore, I've got all of him I want, because there's so, always so much more. And I want everything that he has for me. Christ simply, the Holy Spirit, wants to deepen our intimacy with God and to, and to help us to become more like Jesus. I don't know whether you've been touched by what I've been saying this morning. I'd love to, if the ministry, to you, if the, the prayer, if the prayer team, if the, the worship team, if you could just come up and play for us. And I'd just like to invite a, a time of ministry. If, if the Holy Spirit has been speaking into your heart and you can think to yourself, yeah, I've been compromising my faith and you want to repent from that, can I invite you to come forward? We've got a couple of folks, uh, Abby and, uh, and Helen, who will pray with us as well. And we'd just like to pray over you. We'd just like to pray for you. That, you know, there is, there is forgiveness here this morning. The Lord just wants to forgive you. So if, you, if there is anything that you'd like to repent of, and if you want to come along to the front and stand up in front of everybody and say, I have compromised my faith. And if there's anybody here who hasn't compromised their faith, I'd love to meet you and have a chat with you afterwards. Because I know I have. And we all have.
but it's something we all need to be earnest and repent of. So as again, if, if you'd like to come forward, put some prayer over that. And also, if you'd just like to deepen your intimacy with Jesus, just want to pray for a deeper, intimate relationship with him, then please come forward and we'd love to pray for you to have that ever deepening and intimate relationship. So um, Sarah and uh, Abby, if you'd like to come forward and then if anyone would like to have some prayer, we're here for you. Thank you. have passed away your love has stayed the same your constant grace remains the cornerstone Things that we thought were dead are breathing in life again. You cause your sun to shine on darkest nights. For all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be our anthem song. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one, my heart adores Jesus. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one, my, my heart adores. The hopeless have found their hope. The orphans now have a home. All that was lost has found its place in you. You lift our weary head. You make us strong instead you took these rats and made them beautiful for all that you've done we will pour out our love this will be my anthem song Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one, my, my heart adores. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love, we love you, we love you, oh, how we love you. You are the one, my, 
my heart adore our affection our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus our affection our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus our affection our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus our affection our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus our affection our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus our affection our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus we love you oh how we love you you are the one my my heart adores Jesus we love you oh how we love you you are the one my my heart adores and then we'll just praise the lord with one final worship song to send us on our way if that's okay Do Lion and the Lamb. Oh, lovely. Thank you. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Oh yes it will. Every knee will bow before God. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Oh yes, we do, God. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? 
Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Amen. Hallelujah. Thanks, Jesus. Amen. Let's give it up again for this wonderful group. And thank you so much for coming here this evening. Just some closing words, if I may. If you want intimacy with the Lord Jesus, and I know that you do, you won't find it in the big cathedrals. You won't find it in the gold-laden churches. You will find it where people are hurting. That's where you'll find intimacy with Jesus because that's where Jesus is in the midst of the pain and suffering of his people. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him, the mighty power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul is saying, I don't want you just for the good times. I want you there at all times where there's pain and suffering. I want to be there with you. I want that intimate relationship with you, that I may know him the mighty power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to your death. And if you pray that prayer and you mean it, you will know intimacy with Jesus. I can promise you now, you will weep where he weeps. You'll know righteous anger where he knows anger. You'll know joy where he knows joy. And you'll rejoice where he rejoices because you will have a deep intimacy with Jesus. So, our service here is ended. For as we go through those doors, our service begins. Our service in taking Christ out of here into our communities and the world beyond us. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you've been with us this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we're all works in progress. That we're on a path, Lord, a path of discovery. And that there is no condemnation for those who trust and love you, Lord. That you will take us where we are. Take us where, we, where you want us to be, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, and praise you that you do that with gentleness. So, Lord, we just, again, praise you for this morning. And, uh, Lord, may we go from this place filled with your Holy Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Be all that you will have us be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stay for tea and coffee, refreshments and everything else that is going.